Jessamyn Newhouse is a professor of U.S. history and popular culture at SUNY Plattsburgh and director of the Plattsburgh Center for Teaching Excellence. Recipient of the SUNY Chancellor's Award for Excellence in Teaching, she is the author of Geeky Pedagogy, a guide for intellectuals, introverts, and nerds who want to be effective teachers. An editor of the forthcoming anthology, Picture of a Professor, interrupting bias about faculty and increasing student learning. In addition to the two historic monographs, Manly Meals and Mom's Home Cooking, Cookbooks and Gender in Modern America, and Housework and Housewives in American Advertising, Married to the Mop, Jessamyn has published <laughs> pedagogical, historical, and cultural studies research in numerous anthologies and journals. She regularly gives presentations and workshops on teaching as the editor of Teaching History, a journal of methods, as an advocate for scholarship on teaching and learning that celebrates infinite diversity and infinite combination. Jessamyn's mission as an educational developer is to help faculty nerd out about teaching and to use their big smart brains for increasing pedagogical self-efficiency. And let's have a hand for Jessamyn Newhouse. Good morning, hello. Hello and welcome. Thank you so much, Travis and Shelly, and thank you, everybody. I know you are busy people, especially right now during syllabus season, and your time is valuable. So let's start by giving yourselves and Travis and Shelly a round of applause. I'm Jessamyn Newhouse. I'm author of Geeky Pedagogy, a book that now I think I wrote directly just for Travis. Um, I'm a professor of history and director of the SUNY Plattsburg Center for Teaching Excellence. You can find me on Twitter at Geeky Pedagogy, and if you are tweeting the conference, I hope you'll tag me. I'm going to start with a short introduction and then a discussion of some examples of alternatives to traditional grading, including a close look at an assignment I use that's a combination of different grading strategies. And we will also have time for brainstorming your ideas. I've posted materials for this talk on my website. That's geekypedagogy.com slash grades. Introduction, pay attention to the woodpeckers. One spring morning a few years ago, my husband started hearing this tap, tap, tap on the wall outside his home office. So we went outside and when, when we stood and looked up, we saw a teeny tiny hole in the wooden siding of our house. It was a woodpecker hole. But Neither of us paid that much attention because it was, it was one small bird. It was kind of interesting and cute, actually, and, and we were really busy with other stuff. And anyway, it was probably going to move into a tree pretty soon. There's trees all around the house. Uh, it couldn't do that much damage, said the narrator with ominous foreshadowing. We failed to fully accept and acknowledge the reality of the situation. And we failed to approach reality with our full, mindful curiosity and attention. If we had been paying attention, real attention, we would have hired a woodpecker relocation service immediately. But instead, this story ends with two sad people. <laughs> and an astronomical bill for new woodpecker-proof siding for the whole damn house. <laughs> we got stuck on what we wanted reality to be, i.e., woodpeckers can't destroy your house and ruin your financial future, instead of what is, i.e., yes, yes, they can, and, and they will. Grading has long been the woodpecker drilling holes in my pedagogy home. Just that little tap, tap, tapping on my teaching practices that I've been trying to pretend will just go away, 
but actually is going to reduce my energy and joy in teaching to a pile of sawdust if I don't pay closer attention. The vast majority of my worst conflicts with students, as well as shortcomings I've identified in my own ability to help students learn, these have been mostly rooted in grades. My biggest stressors, my most discouraging and disappointing moments as an educator have so often been linked in some way to the system of ranking students and assigning letter grades to their learning. And of course, the C word, the COVID-19 pandemic, it brought a whole flock of hyper, hungry, relentless woodpeckers who would not be ignored. But here's the thing, we can happily, productively coexist with woodpeckers. We just have to give them our attention and to approach them with curiosity and a willingness to grow and adapt our teaching practices. We could use our big, smart brains to figure out what they need and then provide it, like their own little birdhouses in which to make their own homes. And in fact, creating the conditions for them to flourish means that one, my house remains unmolested, and two, I can go back to that moment when I was admiring their beaky beauty, you know, through binoculars, appreciating their industry and persistence. So today, we're gonna to talk about some of the many ways we can build those grading birdhouses. But you know, hey, maybe it's just me, maybe you've never had any problems whatsoever with grading. So we're gonna do some low tech polling. There's no apps or online tools required. I know Travis is like an educational technology wizard, uh, but I am not, so low tech, just more Fingers, when you raise your hand, is more frequency. So if this happens to you a lot, five. Uh, only sometimes three never happens. Don't raise your hand. Of course, this is optional. No pressure to participate. OK. So first scenario, does this happen to you frequently, sometimes, or never? Grading major assignments causes me stress. Okay, there's a range, but a lot of fives, fours I'm seeing. Uh, grading causes, sometimes causes conflicts with students. Two, good, let's see some, okay, so more in the middle, a lot. Uh, okay, now be honest. Grading can make me bored out of my gourd. <laughs> all right, good, yes, all right, so this is an honest group. I'm seeing a lot of four and fives, good. I worry that the letter grade a student earns for an assignment does not accurately reflect their authentic learning, for good or for ill. Does not reflect their authentic learning. A range, range. I'm frustrated when students do not seem to listen to or apply my feedback. Okay. Yeah, there's, a, there's a threes, from threes to fives I'm seeing. I have concerns that grading systems may be perpetuating academic inequity. Ten, I see. Ten. Is there a concern you have about grading that I missed? And Travis has the mic if anyone wants to share a concern about grading that I missed. A concern I have is who is the grading for? Yes. You know, and what good is it doing good. To, to whoever it's for? Good, thank you. Yes, what's it for? Yes, good. Let's do one more. I saw that hand. Uh, oh, say, sorry. That's a good one. Thank you, yes, so the power dynamic, the top-down, and the way it disrupts collaborative nature of teaching and learning, and one over here. Um, I would add to that 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 
affects the motivation of students. Affects the motivation of students, thank you. For points rather than for the actual learning. Yes, thank you. Lots of people in higher education share our experiences and those concerns. We seem to be reaching a moment of reckoning with traditional grading systems. That's to quote Joshua Eiler. And when I say traditional grading, I mean students complete individual work. That work is assessed one time by the instructor who assigns a numerical or letter ranking to it. Accelerated by world-changing events of the pandemic and intersecting global health, political, and social crises, educators are re-examining how grades can damage student efficacy, the classroom community that like was mentioned, student motivation, interfere with authentic learning, and decrease student success and inclusion, including contributing to systemic racism and historical marginalizations in higher ed. So all that said, I am not an ungrading revolutionary. I'm not advocating we throw out all traditional grading practices. Instead, I preach a gospel of grading abundance. I want us to multiply our options and expand the variety in how students demonstrate their learning and how we assess that learning. I want you to think about what do you most love about your area of expertise? What are you most passionate about? What's the thing that made you want to study this topic forever, you big nerds? <laughs> Think about it. In geeky pedagogy, I argue that nerding out about teaching practices and pedagogical learning can be rooted in that deep abiding fascination we scholars and academics have for our scholarly subjects. Instead of serving as geek gatekeepers, working to keep people out of our beloved academic area of study, we can cultivate a geek culture of sharing, focusing on helping students learn how to do things in and with our disciplinary fields. Today, I invite you to consider how incorporating some non-traditional grading practices into your course design can help you build a geek culture of sharing by putting subject skills at the center of assessment, maximizing opportunities for students to succeed while decreasing your stress, and maybe, just maybe, even bringing some more personal enjoyment to the assessment and grading process by allowing you to do more of what you love doing as an expert in your field. Part one, we have options. Now, if you came to this talk hoping I was going to wave a wand or give you a handful of magic grading beans that would work for everyone, everywhere, every time, you're going to be disappointed. There is no one size fits all, always fixes all the problems, pedagogical strategy for any aspect of teaching. For one thing, each instructor's individual and unique teaching context always matters. Our embodied identity matters. Gendered and racialized assumptions and expectations about academic expertise impact teaching, learning, and grading conditions. Employment status matters. Department culture matters. These factors always shape how and where an instructor can experiment with any pedagogical practice, including assessment. But fortunately, I don't believe in all or nothing. Adding even one small birdhouse for those grading woodpeckers can have a big impact, which makes using at least some alternative grading practices doable for most people in most teaching contexts. There is a vast buffet of non-traditional grading options out there. And I, I spent many hours experimenting with buffet images for slides <laughs> before I decided on this boring um, <laughs> clip art possibilities. Uh, and so I encourage you to explore these options and think about where you can add to your pedagogical practices. What each of these options have in common is that they try to remove the grade from the center of students' experiences in a class and emphasize instead the achievement of subject learning skills. 
In all cases, these practices demand a ton of upfront clarity, discussion, and explanation. The learning objectives and the assessment structures must be crystal clear to everyone because students, especially high achieving students, and I think too, you can tell me, but I think too, uh, your student population of very practical, um, sort of practical minded, high achieving students, they will be nervous about non-traditional grading. It's essential to give students the why, the information and background on why you're choosing to use a non-traditional grading structure. And to do this, it can be helpful to have them identify and reflect on ways that grading has negatively impacted their learning in the past. So for instance, if you just ask that, they'd be like, I don't know. But if you say, have you ever, because you were very worried about how an exam was going to impact your course grade, crammed, 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 took the exam, got the grade, forgot everything you just learned? And they will all say, oh yeah, that's happened to me. Make sure students have a lot of time and numerous opportunities to ask questions and expect pushback and anxiety. Students may assume you're trying to trick them. I know, it's, it's sad, but it, they may. Uh, examples of completed work and tips from students in previous semesters can be very reassuring. And I'd also encourage you a teaching tip I recently gleaned from my personal pedagogical learning network on Twitter. I encourage you to end an uh, initial discussion about this not with the dreaded, so are there any questions, which kills everybody's souls and curiosity, um, but instead, okay, so what information, what explanations do you need today before you leave this room so that you can start this assignment with confidence? that you will succeed. What information do you need? So let me give you four examples of non-traditional grading practices. And many of you may have been using parts of these, all of these, um, but I'm just gonna give a quick overview here. First, mastery or completion grading. One of the best ways we can reduce grading stress in most teaching contexts is to identify some specific skills or foundational content knowledge in our classes that we can assess very, very simply as, yes, you got it, almost there, no, you gotta keep trying. So say, like for example, say that there's some very specific terminology a student needs to understand and be able to use correctly before they can go complete the next stage of the class. You can use mastery grading to ensure student understanding. So every student has to take a quiz on those terms and it's assessed but not graded. Green check mark, good to go. Yellow attention, almost there. Uh, red X, go back to your notes. If we allow students to make multiple attempts on something like this, it underscores the fact, not, it's not about the grade, but that you understand this so you can go on successfully to the next part of the assignment. A variation on this approach includes giving students the opportunity to reflect on a graded quiz or exam, make corrections individually or working in small groups of peers. In the next example, portfolio grading, students complete work over the course of the semester into a, they compile work over the course of the semester into a portfolio. The instructor provides formative feedback along the way things students have to apply to their next assignment. It's easy to do this uh, in, set up in your LMS so you can see it yourself. You can provide feedback uh, if, if the grading, ungrading anxiety is high. You can provide feedback like if this was a graded assignment, it would earn this number of points or this letter grade. The portfolio can include a range of different types of assignments demonstrating progress toward learning goals you've stated and or goals students create for themselves. It usually includes a reflective component where students identify what they've learned, how they've applied your feedback, and so on. One particularly well-documented type of non-traditional grading is contract grading. Defined by Peter Ramoskowitz, contract grading means establishing an agreement with students regarding the quantity 
and quality of work they need to complete, among other criteria, which is correlated to a particular grade. This overlaps and intersects with a similar strategy detailed in Linda M. Nielsen's book, Specifications Grading. The instructor bundles assignments and students aim for a particular grade by completing the bundled assignment of their choice. And here's an example of this approach. This is from Robert Talbert, a math professor at Grand Valley State University. You can see that he provides feedback and assessment all semester, but not a letter or point grade. He's using excellent, satisfactory, or not satisfactory. And again, if you want to take more time looking at this slide, you can find that link on geekypedagogy.com slash grades to all my slides. Self-assessment is one of the non-traditional grading practices that I've been able to sprinkle into my classes. For self-assessment assignments, you can provide or co-create with students the assessment framework and learning benchmarks. It's a great way to help students set their own unique learning and academic goals, and it really helps build metacognition skills. So here's an example from the senior research seminar I teach, the research log. This is how it's summarized on my syllabus, and as I've highlighted, I access each log entry with feedback, including outstanding, satisfactory, or not satisfactory, but no specific grades or points assigned, just feedback on how to keep improving. So it's a way all semester long to, for students to identify and reflect on how they're doing, obstacles they faced, how they've overcome challenges on their big, big research project. At the end of the semester, in their final entry, they review and self-assess their work in the whole log, including suggesting a numerical grade. I use this summative self-assessment as the basis for the assignment grade. I'm saying the assignment is the research log. This is separate from the research paper. I reserve the right to enter a different grade, but I can report that in the vast majority of cases, I agree with the student's own assessment. And maybe just as importantly, this so reduced stressful grade-related wrangling, the way I structured this. Towards the end of the semester, when they were getting tired and distracted, a couple of students forgot to do a log entry. Right, there were 10 entries, they forgot entry eight. But this was not a big deal because there was no grade associated with it. So I did put in, not satisfactory, you didn't submit an entry, but no subsequent arguments about deadlines or talking about makeup work or negotiating. I could just say to the student, there's no grade associated with it. So in your last summative reflection, tell me how you missed this entry, what was going on, how you're going to make sure with time management uh, in the future you're going to avoid this. I care about your learning, not about just checking the box on the assignment. So tell me. What did you learn? And it worked like magic because we were having this real conversation about learning and time management and what else was happening, uh, not a negotiation about an arbitrary deadline. So I'm gonna pause here five minutes. We just wanna to turn to your neighbor. How do you think a grading structure like self-assessment might reduce your grading-related stress how could it increase students' academic agency? That is, their ability to set and meet academic goals and to see themselves as having power and responsibility for their own learning. Let's just do this. Turn to the person next to you or a group of th three, and we'll take five minutes.
People talking about teaching. Oh, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we're here for. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for sharing your thoughts, and we will have more time for discussion. Part two, a combo grading case study. I'm going to give you a detailed example of a combo grading practice from my own teaching. And by combo, I just mean that this is an assignment that combines some ungraded aspects of assessment, some non-traditional grading, and some traditional grading. When I began teaching, I adhered to a very traditional grading uh, system for the major assignment in my class, the research paper. Right, that's what I've been trained to do. It's how I knew to just demonstrate knowledge, research paper. And my syllabus basically said, do a research paper for a big chunk of your final grade and turn it in at the end of the semester. This grading structure never worked very well with my Plattsburgh students. Students weren't completing enough good research, they weren't formulating good arguments, and they weren't expressing their ideas well in writing. All the major learning outcomes for doing a research paper in my discipline in history. And also, frankly, I started to dread reading and assessing a big stack of mostly not great papers. It made me feel like crap about myself and about my students and about the whole enterprise of teaching and learning. Um, yet, Ironically, doing historical research, that's my jam. I love finding and reading books and sources, and I wanted to better create a geek culture of sharing with students the joy, yes, the joy, of researching, footnoting, outlining, and writing. So I started to break up, I don't know what's going on, the, 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 Pure, one pyramid just says letter grades. And then um, the uh, chunked up pyramid has letter grades at the top. So I started to break the assignment into steps where I could check student understanding and make corrections without the sword of that summative grade hanging over everyone's neck. So using a combination of grading strategies allows me to give feedback they can actually apply and use and I can assess and measure the things that really matter to achieving the learning goals. So this is broken up, and it's also on the back of the bibliography. There's a couple printed out copies, and you can access it, the bibliography, and my slides at geekypedagogy.com grades. This is a more detailed look at some of the assignments I use for each type of the grading. And I just want to highlight a few key points. This structure emphasizes the vital role of revision to student writing. Very few, if any of my students arrive to my classes, understanding that revision isn't a bug, it's a feature of effective academic writing. Also, increasingly, my student population they really need structures for peer-to-peer -peer interactions, academic interactions. It just won't happen naturally, um, but it's so, so important to their success. So I created a peer pod assignment. You can tell from my titles, I do have a weakness for alliteration. So peer pod assignments where students, they can meet virtually or in person, and they do things like uh, library shared work sessions or peer review, they practice their presentations. Uh, then they submit for these peer pod assignments, they submit reflections on that process, identifying how it helped them make progress. There's no letter grade. It's not graded group work. It's basically simply completion. Do it and tell me how it went. And this is also a great place to put uh, shout outs to people. So part of their reflection assignment could be who really helped you understand this process better. And then I can give a shout out in a large class. You could do this in a shout out to everybody. I read your, your peer pod reports and I just want to give a shout out to so and so and so and so. 
and they love it. Like seeing their name on the forum post is like the big time. Um, they also submit reflections on what they learned, how they've applied my feedback and their peer feedback over the course of this project. Using this structure has undoubtedly improved my students' abilities to achieve the learning outcomes, which is, of course, awesome, yay. But the thing I really want to emphasize, and if you take nothing else from my talk, take this. This has made grading easier and more enjoyable for me. At first glance, this looks like so much more work when it comes to grading and assessment. And yes, to be fair, it did take me time and effort to create clear structures for each aspect of this assignment. And I should know, I didn't do it like all at once. I started building, adding over the course of a few semesters. It takes time to explain to students the non-traditional grading systems. If I kept track of exactly how many minutes I provide feedback, with the chunked up pyramid as opposed to the one pyramid, yes, I spend more minutes. But there is a very big caveat. This is easier for me to grade. And let me say it again, this is easier, less stressful, and way more enjoyable. Why? Because this approach allows me to do, remember when I asked you to think, what's the thing you love? This approach allows me to do the subject skills teaching that I love the most. I love helping students find reliable sources. I just found out that students are increasingly, do you think they Google for stuff? Mm -mm. They go to TikTok, which is bad, bad news for me. TikTok. So, <laughs> that's the bad news. The good news is, I love helping students find reliable sources, and this structure enables me to do that in a meaningful way without student anxiety about getting a bad grade interfering. That was concerns mentioned, someone mentioned, that, that power structure and that grading interfering. So, so look at the chart, instructor feedback only. One of the things they just, it's required, there's a deadline, Instructor feed, but it's instructor feedback only, a preliminary list of their, their sources that they're going to use. If it's a terrible list, and that happens, if it's a terrible list, it's full of unusable sources, I correct them, and they go try again. No impact on their grade. So while I may spend more time on this in terms of minutes spent assessing, I spend way less time in terms of mitigating the inevitable fallout from letter grading and trying to repatch and repair that community, which is the second big reason why this is easier. So much less time spent during all this assessment in justifying a grade. I mean, how many hours, days, weeks of my life have I wasted trying to parse out and writing up reasons why this big, high-stakes, nerve-wracking assignment is a B minus instead of a B. But I was trying to mitigate the conflict, trying to be transparent, trying to do my job well, but it's just so many hours, it just felt wasted into the void. With this assignment structure, when I receive the final, which I see, in, there is a letter grade, point-based letter grade for their final summative, high stakes, final, final draft, they've already revised it several times, gotten my feedback, made improvements, and grading those last papers is much easier. I'm only assessing one thing. Have you applied all the feedback effectively? And in the LMS, I can see it all, all the way along. Now, I'm not saying that this is exactly the structure you should use. What I want to show you is how this enables me to geek out about grading. So call me nerdy, but I just really love laboring with a student to craft the best thesis statement possible. What a rush. I mean, that fuels my egghead energy. So for me, this is what, what works to help me geek out about grading. So before we move on to brainstorming, we will have a, a 10, 15 minutes for that. I do want to pause for any questions or comments so far. I want to pause for five minutes. We'll take two or three questions or comments so far, and Travis has the mic. I think he's tweeting right now, but 
He's got to come to his mic. I saw this hand here in front. I need my non-mic voice. He's coming, but go ahead and get wait, started. Wait, wait. Yes. And I don't TA and graduate. That's right. Individual teaching context matters. Yes. So yes. individual teaching. I, but I'm wondering, as I've grown as a TA and as I'm growing into my instructor role, how do you work with TAs in large gen ed classes to support the TA in learning mm -hmm. how to grade and give effective feedback and also understanding that it's not their class, they That's don't right. have ownership? The instructor might also not be full professor. Just how does that work, especially yeah. in these in these larger classes where you have diffused responsibility? Yes, I'm going to have to defer to the uh, shared experiential wisdom of your colleagues. I don't actually have graduate students. SUNY Plattsburgh doesn't have graduate students, but the issue you're pointing to there is the one I would like to again emphasize and remind everybody our unique teaching context really matters. What you can implement or shift around or change or experiment with is really shaped and impacted by our employment status, by our embodied identity, and yeah, tenure status matters really as well. Um, I guess the only th other thing I'd in encourage is to, like I said, consider the vast buffet of options for non-traditional grading and file it in your bank, you know, your pedagogical toolkit and add those tools, even if you're in a position right now where you're not able to implement them all, reflecting on them, thinking about them, reading about them, seeing what all is being discussed, especially around maybe the damage grading can do, is a good thing to file away and just keep building knowledge about. Thank you, but I'm gonna defer, hopefully during conversations, there'll be people who can speak to that board directly. Thank you for that question. One more? Question or comment? I saw this hand here. Right. Thank you. Um, you said that you use your LMS so that you can refer back yes. to that cumulative feedback you've yes. given. Do you have structural suggestions for that so that it's easy to access your prior feedback rather than it being kind of tucked into a, like a pull down menu yes. of revisions? Thanks. Yes, the, the one thing I would recommend is that in, the, so it's it, it cumulatively in the students when they submit a new assignment, for example, or like a revised assignment, that part of that revised assignment is what did I tell you to do? Quote me. <laughs> and then tell me, how did you apply this? So there's, and it's in one place. Yeah. And there, there are ways to, in LMS, I'll refer to, again, the wizard over there. Um, I know when you're nerding out, I'm calling you a wizard. That's so awesome. Uh, or Thor. Um, there are ways to, you could set up a sort of separate assignment or, or a section where all the feedback is compiled in one place, so you could look at it and the student could look at it all in one. And having it in two places repeated, great. You know, one is on the individual assignment, one is in the feedback corner, or whatever you want to call it. Feedback forum. Got to use alliteration. <laughs> all right, thank you for those questions, comments, and we will have more time for discussion. But I want to give you some time for brainstorming, part three. This is my favorite part of any talk or workshop. Um, I think we'll do this. I have small groups, but that buzz of people talking was so great. I think we'll, we'll go back to a group of two, uh, just turn to your neighbor or a group of three. Um, what I want you to think and talk about small and doable. We're, we're not today gonna talk about radical course redesign. One small birdhouse, one small selection from the buffet of non-traditional grading options that will allow you more time to nerd out about the things you love helping students learn how to do or do better. Think, what is that thing you love? Me, craft a thesis statement, help students find sources. So what is one non-traditional grading addition or change you could make or are already using successfully to reduce grade-related stress for you and your students? What obstacles might you encounter 
and what kind of supports would you need, like from your trusted teaching and learning center? What kind of supports would you need to incorporate some non-traditional grading into your teaching practices? And Travis, how are we doing on time? Do you want to say 10 minutes or 15? Okay, so we'll do 15 minutes for this discussion. 15 minutes. Again, whoops, again in uh, small groups of two or three. And I'll circulate. So now you're so
I, I hate to cut off the conversation. It really brings me pain to have to cut off such a lively conversation. But I do want to give just a few minutes, I wanted to add just a few minutes to report back to the group on that last point. I'd like to hear, and I know the um, ETE staff would love to hear as well, uh, and your peers and colleagues, what kinds of support do you need right now to incorporate some non-traditional grading into your teaching? Let's take three or four minutes, just a, some quick report, reporting back. What kinds of support do you need to, start, to think about or start incorporating some non-traditional grading into your teaching practices? What kinds of support? Yeah. I know it's probably more difficult, and it sounds easy, but if in Canvas, if there was a way where for self-assessment and peer assessment, if they could actually type in a number, and that would be the grade, that I could review. So instead of using comments and various other things, but they could actually enter in their own grade hmm. that then I could review. So that would be a great field to have. Yeah, the, uh, so L LMS, and it would certainly, that would boost like the empowerment sense for students. Yeah, interesting. LMS, LMS support, thank you for that. What other kinds of support? I think it'd be um, really helpful if the concept of non-traditional grading or ungrading was actually introduced to the students when they started uh, at the university in like that, that first introductory class or like the concept was already talked about with students so it wasn't a new concept when they came yes. into our classrooms. Thank you. Yes, that's such a great point. Uh, the kind of cultural discussion about it so it's not just simply me professor newhouse doing her crazy thing but that's something that the students had heard of before so ways where other places that might be introduced or discussed yeah thank you yeah i actually just wanted to uh give a shout out to ete for being so supportive and providing so many resources for this uh, where i worked previously I was trying to do a lot of non-traditional or ungrading things, and I was always looking behind my back, mm. thinking I'm gonna get in real trouble. Yeah. And <laughs> when I interviewed here, I was like, yeah, I have some you know, real non-traditional ideas about grading, and I was tried to be upfront about it. They hired me, and I thought, okay, <laughs> here we go. And, and, and I still was looking behind my back, but, but then ETE comes along and, and they're fully supportive and they're like, you, you just go for it. So that, the support is there. Yay, I love that. <laughs> Thank you, I love it. Let's take just a, a couple more. What other kinds of support? Do you, I'm right here. Okay. Fantastic lady I work with in my course design and web design and stuff has really sat on me hard about uh, grading rubrics. Mm -hmm. And uh, though I've added them with specific detail in several categories, I realized as I listened to you that I need to help the students use that as a guide not just as a, uh, a justification for the grade. Yep, good, thank you. Talking about rubrics, I've had a lot of success with co-creating rubrics with my students. So asking them, what do you think should be assessed and why? And in bonus, I get a lot of students saying, wow, this is really hard, Professor Newhouse, how do you do this? I'm like, I know, pat myself on the back, it is hard. Um, but co-creating, you can't, like again, maybe not for every aspect of the class, every big assignment, but helping students identify the important benchmarks, um, maybe, a, maybe a one for themselves, unique for themselves, they can show you, these are the things I'm hoping to achieve that are important to me, and then they can self-assess it and you can weigh in on it as well. Thank you. Rubrics, good. Oh, one more. Kinds of support. 
um, or other, we have a few minutes for other questions or concerns or comments for me. Here. I just had a quick question related to the first question about giving students experience with this kind of non-traditional grading. And <clears throat> yes. if there, I'm hoping that there are people in here that are involved in elementary or secondary education mm -hmm. that can answer this. But I would, my experience with having a kid who's going through school mm -hmm. is that it seems like this is what they're doing now. This kind of non-traditional grading is really what kids are growing up with now. Right, where it's really mastery based and it's really, so I wonder if they're actually, mm -hmm. we're gonna do a favor to our incoming students who are younger, who are growing up in an environment where really the kind of grading they're getting is this kind of non-traditional skills based mastery sort of completion sort of completion. grading. And I'd love it if somebody knows more about yeah. education than I do who could speak to that. That's so interesting because that is not my experience with my student population in New York State. I wonder if there's like state, state public education, but what, do politics play a role in education? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but in my experience, the students who arrive to Plattsburgh coming from New York State public school systems have done nothing but graded, very traditional graded um, assessment. And this is very radical. The, even like one, ass one assignment is a radical change for a lot of, so I think it must vary student population to student population. And it might be that raises a great point about getting to know our students and maybe asking them for their past experiences before we plop down, here's a, here's a non-traditional grading, um, at really ascertaining how familiar are they with it and that seeing what kind of range there might be. Here. I would just say that personalized competency-based instruction is on the rise in Utah. It won't be universal, but that is a big push okay. starting a couple years ago and ongoing. That's great. So yes, okay, they are good. getting more of that here. Good. Of course it varies, but. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Other questions for me? Oh, here in the middle, Travis. Thank you. I make you run home. <laughs> so first of all, I'd like to say that in principle, uh, I, I'm really attracted to the idea. And actually, <laughs> I was talking with uh, two of my colleagues, and uh, we're just about to change our syllabi. So thank you. Um, I have a question, though. Well, it's more of a com comment um, about the, uh, the kind of support. So. Um, I don't see myself being able to apply this yet. Mm -hmm. I would love to apply this to my first and second year mm -hmm. students. I teach French. Uh, and um, I'm having a hard time just thinking about how this could work. So if any of my colleagues in languages are actually interested into uh, incorporating this into your first and second year, please let's let's brainstorm together because I I think this is great, but I I need yes. I need more exchanges. Yes, thank it's just, you. We need to do that. Yes, thank you. I really appreciate that. I know in my university context, the way my campus culture exists, discipline-based discussions about teaching are very very effective. So finding the other people, connecting with them in your discipline to exchange ideas. I'd also encourage you, there's so much great scholarship of teaching and learning out there that is discipline-based, um, searching uh, for discipline-based articles, advice about non-traditional grading practices. I bet there's some out there. Thank you. I have time for one, or one more here in front. Oh, here and then here. Two more. Uh, Professor Barron in aviation in the STEM Hi. career fields. Um, we've had a discussion um, about this topic over the years because we have, in addition to the students and the faculty input, industry. And mm -hmm. so a lot of STEM or even languages, yes. you have industry standards. Yes. And so we want to not take out that stress. We want them to have that stress. And so we, mm -hmm. the... <laughs> 
the FA requires 70% passing, we require 80. And that's given us a 99% pass rate on this mm -hmm. exam. And so we actually want to make our stage checks and our academic credentials so rigorous that when they go to the FA examination, it's easier. And so in some ways, I understand, and this mm -hmm. is one of the best presentations to talk about assignments. In our history class and our build classes, there's many ways we can yes. incorporate some of the, those practices. But when it comes down into the STEM fields, when you've got industry standards, sure. how do you balance yeah. um, reducing that stress when you actually want them to go day one on the job, yes. having had that challenge yep. and experience in those, yeah, yeah. Those, those difficult times? Yes, that's a great question. And what I would, just off the top of my head, what I would suggest is there may be room for assignments that encourage metacognition, self-reflection, personal goal setting, things that people need to be successful in high stress, high demand industries and incorporating that in. Remember, I'm not, I'm not an ungrading revolutionary. I am a gospel of abundance. So I can think of an example, like if a student has to prepare for a very uh, industry-based, high stakes, high stressful exam, of course they need to do that. They also could really benefit from reflecting on their own preparation practices. Are they really studying effectively? Are they really reviewing? and not just like reading over and over and over, that's not effective. Are they forming study groups where they quiz each other? Are they trying to remember correctly? And then how did they prepare? And then how are they gonna handle uh, obstacles when they hit obstacles? Those are all things that you could sprinkle in to a class to help students build those skills with very professional goal in mind. You're heading out into industry, you have to be able to work constructively with other people. You have to be able to overcome obstacles. So how are you gonna do that? And those could be ways with non-traditional grading and assessment. Thank you. Thank you for that question. And one more. Yeah, I'm old enough to have been jaded by bad experiences with mastery learning where assessment items were objectively scored and you know just assessed rote memorization and lower mm -hmm. cognitive skills. So. Mm -hmm. What's changed since, since I've had those experiences? I'm sorry, to, you have to repeat. I'm not sure what, what you're asking. Well, the experiences I had with mastery learning early in my careers, you know, students were assessed. The assessment items were constructed so that they were easily scored, objectively scored. Uh -huh. and, and by that nature, they assessed rote memorization, procedural skill, lower cognitive okay. uh, levels of yes. learning, and just what's changed right. since then. So I would say that using mastery or completion grading, this is just my personal, this is just my take on it. Mastery or completion grading can be useful when there is very specific, very uh, preliminary steps that students need to achieve to move on to the next higher order, higher, more demanding step in an assignment or a class. I personally haven't had much success with that format, mastery or completion. Um, I know a lot of people really find it helpful, but it's for very, very focused, focused things, not like huge sections of you must do this to, to go on successfully, but very, very specific, like a term or a skill. Like for me, it might be, uh, can you in two sentences, what's the difference between the history and the past? What's the difference between history and the past? So students can articulate that in a couple sentences. And just so they've said it, they've heard it, and that will help them move on to the next, next stage. But it's worth considering, you know, is it helping, like uh, all of these, is it helping your students do things, do things better? Does it work in your individual context? Thank you for that question. I'm gonna wrap up. So thank you everyone for sharing your ideas. I hope you're leaving today feeling more prepared to nerd out about grading, talking with your colleagues and ETE about how to explore some non-traditional strategies. Thank you so much for your time. <laughs> Thank you.
please pay attention to those woodpeckers. Teach long and prosper.